Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that those annoying gut bacteria that keep on growing in your gut and maybe doing good things and maybe doing bad things, well, at this point, they've been proven to do maybe more good than bad depending on who you are. But if you are an elite athlete, it turns out your gut bacteria might help boost your physical performance. That's because scientists just figured out that microbes that grow in the guts of some runners after a marathon boosted the time that lab mice ran on a treadmill. And these researchers were from Harvard, which means that they have a cool accent that sounds like they're from Boston, and they published in Nature Medicine magazine. And it turns out these bacteria make lactate, which is something that your muscles also make during exercise, and they turn lactate into a compound that can help with endurance. And what the researchers did, and by the way, I think this is incredibly cool, even though it's gross, is they collected stool samples from 15 elite runners for five days before and after they ran the 2015 Boston Marathon. I just, I want to know what email they sent to the runners, like, hey, like, we're really interested in your poop. Uh, But anyway, they found them. And they compared those uh, microbial makeups with that uh, poop from 10 non-runners. I also want to see those emails. Hey, is your poop as good as a marathoners? I just, I don't even know, but the marketing for that had to be fun. Anyway, the runner samples showed a bump in the abundance of bacteria from a genus called Valonella. And by the way, if I said that wrong, I, I'm going to get corrected in today's episode by people who really know how to pronounce these Latin words. Uh, the team also saw an increase in that bacteria species in a group of 87 ultramarathoners and Olympic trial rowers. In other words, if you're doing all of this exercise, maybe it's just to make the bacteria change. Maybe you could just change the bacteria without the exercise. Oh my God, would that be the ultimate biohack? It would be for me. Because then you're like, ha ha, look at you runners. I just popped a pill and ate some prebiotics or whatever, and I'm good to go. That's my hope anyway. And uh, I'm completely down with cheating and upgrading and actually doing things better than the way we used to do it. Because it turns out running away from tigers is something we've probably done since before our prefrontal cortexes were fully formed. There's got to be a better way, like spaceships or something. Anyway, back to these researchers. They cultured one strain called Valonella atypica from a runner and fed it to 32 mice. And not all the mice responded to the treatment, which is kind of interesting. But on average, the mice that got the bacteria from the runner's poop ran 13% longer in experiments than mice in a control group. Now, if you're an elite runner, that's kind of something that could could be, dare I say, badass. See what I did there? All right, sorry, I had to do that. Anyway, these bacteria eat lactate to get the carbon they need to grow, and it causes them to make propionate, which is something that raises heart rate and oxygen use in mice. It's also one of the reasons that I tell you and have for a very long time on the Bulletproof Diet, eat your vegetables already. Now... Uh, The first guest is Tina Anderson, who's co-founder of Just Thrive Health, and she actually was a trial lawyer, which is awesome because I'm going to try and make some attorney jokes during the episode today. (laughs) And after she had her second child, she turned to being an in-house counsel for a family pharmaceutical company and didn't like what she saw and decided that she was going to go into natural health and is now really focused on fixing people's guts. And she's partnered with uh, Kieran Krishnan, who's a research microbiologist who's really looking at microbiology, something called gut commensal spore bacteria. And he's going to really uh, lay down some uh, some microbiome bombs, if that's a word, uh, about what's really going on in your gut. And also, we're going to talk about something you probably wouldn't imagine, but did you know there's a probiotic that can survive being baked? Uh, we're going to talk about that one, too. So, Tina, Kieran, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Great to be here. Beautiful location, by the way. Oh, My microbiome is very happy about this place, so (laughs) (laughs) I can tell right off the bat. Yeah, the 40 Years of Zen is up here in Kenmore, Washington, and uh, this this is a it's like an idyllic, beautiful place. It's also really peaceful and quiet, which is why it's good for a podcast. There shouldn't be too much background noise or airplanes or anything weird like that. Absolutely. All right, where do we want to get started? Uh, let's start with, uh, with Tina. All right, there's about a kabillion uh, uh, probiotic companies. In fact, I've 
spent at least $100,000 over the last 20 years trying to fix my gut and buying every kind of probiotic out there. Uh, and I've never quite, sometimes like, I think this worked, but I don't really know. So what led you to think that the world needs yet another probiotic company? Right. Um, well, we were, as you had mentioned in the intro, we were in the pharmaceutical. My husband and I were in the pharmaceutical industry for many years, and we just saw all of the abuses. We saw the rampant overprescribing of drugs. In fact, one um, one story that comes to mind is a we had won this huge bid at one of the largest hospital systems in the country, and um, it was for a cholesterol med. And the, we won this bid, and everyone's jumping up and down. They're so excited, and the pharmaceutical rep says to my husband, you know what, what we need to do now is I need to go to every single doctor or cardiologist in that hospital system and tell them to lower the number that they prescribe their cholesterol meds to their patients. And we were disgusted. We were like, this is crazy. And, you know, we were surprised, but yet when we thought about it, we weren't that surprised because we saw all of this with, you know, different, um, you know, family members and relatives that they would get on one stomach, you know, one medication for their stom stomach that would lead to another medication for joint pain, which would next thing you know, in a couple months, they would be on, you know, 12 different medications and they're not getting any better. And so we said we need to do something that's more in line with who we are and what we want to do. And so we started learning about gut health. We learned about natural health and focusing more on prevention. And what we found is that like you said, most probiotics really weren't working. Um, they just weren't, they weren't surviving the gastric system. They weren't doing what a true probiotic was supposed to do. And uh, fortunately, we do a lot of uh, deep thinking and um, affirmations and prayer. And we were able to get the exclusive rights to these um, strains, these bacillus strains from London University, Royal Holloway, and um, found out that these strains are actually a completely different category than what uh, what we see um, in 99% of the probiotics on the market. So, so you're the kind of entrepreneur who goes out there, what I call real entrepreneurs, and finds something that says, let me improve that versus the more common kind of entrepreneur who says, oh, there's something, let me go do a crappier job and copy someone else's idea and then sort of pollute the business environment with uh, low quality crap. Uh, if you don't believe me, go to any uh, online marketplace and look at yeah. whether you can tell whether things are good or bad. Unless you're well-educated, you can't because there's a bunch of entrepreneurs just making cheap crap. Exactly. So you didn't just package up some bacteria. You found something that you thought was better. Why did you think this new kind of probiotic was better than everything else out there? Yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm not certain that it is. <laughs> but you have a pretty good case for it, which is why you're on the show. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, because we started delving into the research and the Human Microbiome Project was had recently launched um, with, by the National Institutes of Health and told us more about the microbiome than we ever knew before. Um, it also told us that many of these other, this approach was not working. It was not, in, in order to be a probiotic, it needs to arrive alive in the intestines. It needs to actually confer a benefit onto the host, um, onto the body. And most of these probiotics were just getting into the gut and dying, um, dying before they ever got into the intestines. So um, we looked at the research. We found out that these strains have been used in Asia and Europe for you know, so over 60 years, um, sometimes as a pharmaceutical and having some really profound results. One of the things that really intrigued me is uh, uh, people who are, are like longtime followers probably have heard me talk about eye armor. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really into protecting the eyes. Uh, and I, I have a whole company called True Dark that makes the glasses you always see me wear. Um, but the the strain that you that you use, the, at least one of the strains, but the patented strain called Bacillus Indicus HU36, it makes most of the stuff that's in eye armor, which is kind of cool, on board. And so I'm seeing uh, other strains of bacteria that are out there. I don't know how, how well they you can make them grow in the gut, but they actually make glutathione, which is another supplement that I make. So the idea is, wait a minute. I'm all over supplements, and I know you guys are supportive of taking supplements as well, but if I can cause my bacteria in my gut to make stuff, they'll probably make things that aren't in the supplements that are one molecule different, but they're also making it as needed. So HU36 makes CoQ10, alpha and beta carotene, lycopene, lutein, astaxanthin, and xanthanin when it arrives in your intestines. That is, those are all the eye supporting ingredients that we have here. So. I like this, uh, and this is something that I take, uh, and I also take 
those those ingredients separately because I think having higher levels of those in Mother Nature wants me to have is in my best interest because Mother Nature wants to kill me because I'm done having kids. Right. <laughs> Screw you, Mother Nature. <laughs> She's mean. All right. Yeah. So so that that was why I wanted to have you on the show because I'm like, all right, that's kind of cool. You've got this you know stuff that's making crazy vitamins that you really um, they're actually they're kind of expensive to to take. I don't think they're making quite as much in the gut as I'm getting in my pills, but I think doing both is the right way to do it. And there's other benefits that come from these besides just those compounds. So you found something unique and different and said, I'm going to take that to market. Uh, how did you go about getting exclusive rights to something like this? It seems like it's kind of a valuable thing. Yeah, so um, I, I had a research company and development company before we started working on Just Thrive. Okay. Um, and my role was really to do design and conduct and run clinical trials for nutritional companies. That's actually kind of how I got into the probiotic space in the beginning. Uh, there was a large multinational company that hired our group to help them develop a new probiotic. And they also wanted us to research the other probiotics in the market in terms of the claims and how they design the products. Do we need 19 strains? Do we need 25 strains? Is it 300 billion or is 50 billion adequate? You know, And then what about the refrigerated stuff versus non-refrigerated? Where What is the right approach? So we started jumping into that pit to try to figure all that stuff out. And we came out of it understanding that most of it is just marketing nonsense. You know, there's very little science to any of it. There's no studies that show 200 billion is better than 100 billion or 300 billion is better than 50 billion. Hold on, hold you know? on. Yeah. This is America. <laughs> something's good for you you need more yeah and if something's bad for you you need zero, zero. and you are not allowed to have a perfect level between zero and infinity <laughs> exactly just so yes. we can be clear on that <laughs> yes we have bad guys and good guys and that's it you know <laughs> and and it's that megalomaniacal society right, right. And more is better and and his thing and this speaks a lot to what you talked about earlier this me too industry that that predominates in the supplement world, right? You, you've got all of these people that come in, they pop up these companies overnight. They've got competitor A that is doing 15 strains and 50 billion. So their, their whole development process is how do we get 17 strains and 75 billion so we can be a little bit better, yep. you know? But it's the same nonsense, right? And, and half the strains that they put in there are probably dead because they didn't have quality a control absolutely. and they wanted to make it cheap and they put a nice sticker on it. Yeah, it's, absolutely. it's a problem, yeah. but it's better than the the pharmaceutical industry so don't yeah. regulate it already all right right exactly <laughs> no and you know and so through our research work we started looking at and we asked the simple question like where did our ancestors get their probiotics from you know clearly we have this amazing commensal relationship with bacteria right we've actually offloaded numerous really important functions to microbes like the like the microbes that you talked about in early in the segment on uh, with the runners right, right? there how do i say that by the way um the the uh Varelia, yeah ver uh, uh, Vela, no, sorry, let me see. Let me look at it. I'll tell you which one it is. <laughs> I promised people uh, that I was going to, and I tell you, listeners, hold me accountable. It's V E I L L O N E L L A. Oh, Velanella. Yeah, so yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Villanella, guys, you heard it here first. <laughs> so then, um, you know, when, when we look at all of these things that we've outsourced to bacteria, because we just don't have the genetics to do it, right? We've got 22, 23,000 functional genes. That's half of what an earthworm has. So we're not as cool as we think we are. The reason we are so cool is because we have 3 million microbial genes in our system. So we count on their DNA for most of our metabolic function. You're and talking about mitochondria. Mitochondria and uh, just our genetic- Gut bacteria. Uh, yeah, gut bacteria. You know, if you look at the human chromosome, right, we've got somewhere around 22,000 functional genes. Um, that was actually a problem that came out of the Human Genome Project. The whole idea behind the Human Genome Project was we're going to have two or 300,000 functional genes, and we're going to find for every disease we have out there, there's going to be a gene that's yeah. responsible for it. Bad right? assumption, right? Bad <laughs> assumption. And then through going through that whole thing, you come to find out that, wait, we barely have enough genetic material in our chromosomes to actually do what we do to be human. So how are we conducting all of these metabolic functions? And as it turns out, we have millions of bacterial DNA in our system that we count on and we use to be when, human. When you say in our system, you mean in our gut? In our gut, but yeah. uh, but they translate from our gut all the way 
throughout the rest of our body. Um, but going back to the spores, how we discovered it, we asked a simple question. Well, where then, did our people don't know what spores are? You haven't talked about. Spores oh yet. yes, okay. So uh, well, and so leading into about, that, yeah, talk about um, this is one of the four strains you guys use. So talk about why you use spore formers. Yeah. So the idea there is we were looking at what microbes exist in the natural world that have developed a unique capability of surviving through our gastric system. You know, a lot of people don't understand that our that our stomach is called a gastric barrier. One of its important roles is to kill stuff that's going through, right? Our stomach acid is so intense that if we were able to touch it with our finger, we would burn off the tips of our fingers, right? It's that intense. And it kills microbes. That's one of its really important jobs. And so all of these other probiotics we're dumping into our system aren't designed to survive through that gastric system. And then after you get past the, uh, past the stomach acid, the next step is bile salts. Bile salts are really antimicrobials. Uh, pept uh, and then after that, you've got pan pancreatic enzymes that are also antimicrobials. So you've got this gauntlet that microbes have to get through when they go through the oral cavity in order to be alive and function in the gut. So our question was, are there microbes that can naturally do that? You know, And if they do naturally do that, then evolution has intended them to perhaps survive through our gastric system and maybe function in the digestive tract. I, I'm going to ask sort of a disgusting question here, yeah. but if it's that hard to get in through the mouth, can you just stick a probiotic <laughs> up your ass and just be done with it? <laughs> so you could, you could. However, in the small intestine, um, there's a really important section called the ileum, which has the Peyer's patches. And the Peyer's patches are the control center for your, uh, for your immune system. And that immune system uh, in, within the Peyer's patches requires interaction with microbes in order to function appropriately. So if you do it rectally, um, you will get microbes into the distal bowel, but you won't see any benefits from the small bowel and the and the got front it. part of the distal so, bowel. So yeah. it's just like you know you, you got to be right in the middle. You can't be on either end. Exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> and you got to get all the way through. To, okay. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's and that that's the sweet spot in there. And so in looking for bacteria that had that capability of surviving through this gauntlet that nature has created, we found that these spores, uh, these bacterial endospores, you call them, um, actually have developed capabilities of surviving through that harsh gastric environment. Uh, so basically when they leave the body, so they're commensal bacteria, they live naturally in the gut, but when they leave the body, they cover themselves in a protein calcified armor. And they can sit in the outside world indefinitely. In fact, the oldest one that was found was over 200 million years old. And still alive? Still alive. They could still plate it. In Southern California, they went into deep recesses of these caves. They found salt crystals, which they then melted out, and they found bacteria in there. And they could still plate the bacteria. It was 250 million years old. And the, these were the bacillus endospores. Um, so they've been here way before we ever existed. And they've kind of helped write the rules of how multicellular organisms communicate. And here's and here's another component of that, right? Uh, and this is from space to your gut, right? So there's this idea, like people have been trying to figure out where did the initial building blocks of life come from on Earth? That stuff that's in the primordial soup. Right? Panspermia? Are we panspermia. Really gonna go there? We're going panspermia. I tell you what, so Bacillus subtilis, the main strain that we have in here, there is a study where they took it out in outer space for seven years. And Bacillus subtilis can survive in the vacuum and cold of outer space for seven years and survive re-entry into the Earth and has a lot of those same components that are thought to be the initial building blocks of life on Earth. Wow. So, you know. That idea of panspermia, that maybe the first life forms arrived you know, on a comet or an asteroid or something hit the Earth, no one's probably ever going to prove that. Right. But uh, maybe it was one of these spore formers. So... You chose this type because of the armor plating. Yeah. What makes the armor come off of this species so that it'll grow at the right place in the gut? Yeah, and that's so that's a really important question. Um, so they make it past the stomach acid. They get to the small intestine. Once they pass slightly past the bile salts when they're in the, the first part of the stomach, uh, the intestine called the duodenum, they do what I call a molecular handshake with mucosal receptors. So in our mucosa, that, that mucus lining on our intestinal uh, wall, there are receptors that we actually express to welcome them in. And that molecular handshake that they do with our receptors tells them that they're in the gut, and then they break out of this shell within 20 minutes. So imagine one of these spores, and there's probably, we're surrounded by them in this beautiful 
outdoor area around well, here, you, the dirt. You, you guys take your own supplements, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming both of you fart. So yeah. there's probably, <laughs> exactly. there's probably, I mean, not, not to be too rude about it, but <laughs> there was a Wired article that says uh, you are surrounded by a cloud of like skin and fart bacteria. Yep. To the point that they can identify who you were two hours after you left a room by yeah. sequencing the DNA of the bacteria in the room. So it's kind of gross, but like, hey, yeah. so it's uh, it's everywhere. I know that in something if we have time, we'll talk about the the microbiome cloud that exists in people's households uh, that are really important. But you know, when you look at nature around us, and you and we have these spores all around, you could go for a hike in in the woods here. Uh, come across one of these spores. Hopefully, get it on your hands and get it into your mouth. Right. It could have been sitting in the on, in the dirt for a million years, inactive in that spore form. Twenty minutes within getting into your gut, it'll break out of the shell and go to work for you as a probiotic. Wow! And there's a bunch of studies. In fact, we've done something about forest bathing. Uh, so, all right, we have these crazy armor-plated immortal bacteria um, that are beneficial, but aren't. I mean, aren't, isn't there a downside? I I look at how much, how much of my life I spent with the ability to clear a room, yeah, uh, because of stuff going on in my gut that was truly truly unnatural. Yeah. <laughs> so I dealt with that, and my gut was wrecked. Yeah, which is why I became such an aficionado of different probiotics and ways to fix the gut. Yeah. Um. So clearly things can go bad yeah. in the gut. How do you know that the species you're using are the right ones, and that other ones won't make something maybe called SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, which a good number of listeners have and some know about. The only way to know is to study it, right? So we we can't make assumptions when it comes to microbes and these really complex microbial communities. So we've done about 16 trials so far. Um, we just published one yesterday on IBS, actually. Um, so we're, we're putting a lot of effort into the science to understand microbial communities, my, microbial community structures and how they work together. As it turns out, these particular microbes in the in the Just Thrive probiotic have a policing effect in the microbiome. So we published a study about a month ago that showed that when you add these Just Thrive probiotics into the microbiome, you actually increase the diversity of the microbiome by almost 45%. Right, so we're taking a microbiome that is less diverse, and we know diversity within the microbiome is is paramount to health and wellness, and even eight, longevity. So, what's so interesting is that you could put four strains into your system, and you have before you put them in there, you have all these undetectable levels of all of these different bacteria. Three weeks after putting them in there, now you have growth of all of these species that you previously couldn't detect, who are at such low levels that they were completely non-functional. And so these bacteria act almost like orchestrators of the microbiome, and we've outsourced that job to them in large part because there's no way for us to endogenously do that outside of diet changes, lifestyle changes, and in introducing the right microbes. So, so if you know? the diet is completely consistent and you just take the Just Thrive uh, combination here, your studies show a 43% increase in diversity? Absolutely. In without any increase in fiber. Weeks, without any increase in fiber. Oh, man, I wish I'd have known yeah. that in superhuman. Yeah, and here's the other part of it. So when you look at diversity, um, there's two components of diversity that confer health. The first component is the number of species, right? That's the richness in your microbial pool. The second one is uniformity. Uniformity is also really important. So there's a couple of indexes that measure diversity. It's called like the Simpson Reciprocal Index. All of those have uniformity in the, in the component as well because uniformity is very important. So you could have lots of different bacteria, but if... 20% of them make up 80% of the actual number of cells or uh, or volume of bacteria, then you're still not achieving total diversity the way you should. Because it wasn't spread out the way it wasn't it spread be. out, so yeah. the fact that it's present doesn't really matter if it's only 0.1% of what's Exactly, that. yeah. Because okay. then its functionality is, is attenuated enough where it's not really contributing to your overall function, right? And so okay. one of the things that we saw with, with the Just Thrive bacteria is that they get in there and they also create uniformity which is so important in the microbiome. Okay. So they make sure you have high diversity and uh, well, equal representation. Well, maybe not equal, but appropriate representation. Appropriate. Yes, you know? exactly. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, all right, that's pretty incredible. Uh, and I, I mentioned earlier, 
what attracted me to the Just Thrive formula was the ability to make all those carotenoids, like those red colored compounds, in fact, the same stuff that you'd find in, in shrimp or in yeah. krill, which is in the which omega-3 how formula. discovered, actually. Oh, in krill? Yeah, and in shrimp, krill, and in uh, salmon and trout. Oh, really? Yeah. So the idea was this. Um, you know, and this was done through a huge European consortium study called the Color Spore Consortium. So it costs somewhere around six and a half million euros. It took about eight years and 80 researchers in different institutes working on this. The idea was where do shrimp get their carotenoids from? Where do salmon get their carotenoids it's to be from? from? Algae, though. Right? You know, well, so that that's what they were trying to figure out, right? They were trying to figure out because they don't eat colored fruits and vegetables, you know, so that that's clearly not a source. My salmon are um, eating blueberries? What? <laughs> <laughs> Your salmon probably are. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Your nice. salmon are a whole other level, so. <laughs> um, but the regular people's salmon are just <laughs> sitting <laughs> around, you know. Mine are super salmon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Superhuman salmon. Um, but, but you know, so what they figured out is um, they are getting it from, from, from algae to a certain degree, but they're not absorbing carotenoids from algae. Oh. Uh, what they're doing is there? There actually, there's actually microbes that will convert metabolites from the algae into carotenoids. So they oh. found that many of these species that express a lot of carotenoids on their skin have bacteria, typically spore-forming bacteria that live in their gut that produce such high levels of carotenoids that it expresses on the skin, and that also denotes health wow. to the species. That is blowing my mind because I, I mean, I, I'm very well read on this stuff, yeah. and I did not. I've I've never heard that and I've never read that anywhere. So it's the bacteria in the salmon yeah. that are converting the algae into the carotenoids. Exactly. That causes them to turn the the flesh to turn that nice pink color. It is. And and same with flamingos, right? So flamingos, people know that they become pink when they go to their their nesting area before they find a mate. And a lot of the mate selection is based on how pink they are. But flamingos are naturally white, but they become pink. Their feathers express that pink color based on how much they feed. And they feed off of these little krill kind of, or, or not krill, but they're brine shrimp, these tiny right, little brine right. shrimp, right? Um, sea monkeys. See, yeah, exactly, <laughs> sea monkeys. And so um, the brine shrimp inside them have these bacteria. So they're actually using the brine shrimp as a vector for the uh, for the bacteria to get in. And then when the bacteria get in, they express the carotenoids. It makes the flamingos really pink. That is programmed in their mind to denote health of that uh, and the ability to procreate for the mate selection process, you know. It is that sort of horrifying? <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, th there's a whole book, and I'm blanking on its name right now. It's some like the parasites that control us or some sort of nasty thing. You've yeah. probably read it. Uh -huh. Remember the yes. name of it? <laughs> yes, I know what you're talking and, about. And it's, it's kind of horrifying because these nasty little single-celled bacteria mm -hmm. uh, or worms and amoebas and protozoans and whatever, they are controlling us at, at a really Pretty horrifying cool. way. Yeah. Like one example there they found that 90% of the fish that get eaten by birds of prey are infected with something that causes the fish to swim to the surface so they get eaten Yes. so that then the birds will poop the parasite eggs onto a snail somewhere else. But something's controlling their mind. So is it possible that the brine shrimp are actually in charge of flamingos and they're just... Absolutely. So when we look at biology, what's fascinating is we always confer that control comes from the most highly evolved creatures, it, right? It's totally not true. It's not true. As you go deeper and deeper and you get down to the cellular level, it's the little stuff that controls so, everything. So should, we should declare war on Brian Trump. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. Uh, I mean, at least we should put them on the do not fly list. You know, at the nice. least. <laughs> oh, man. That was <laughs> <To> begin <smooth>. <laughs> with. <laughs> See, I'm a super nerd that has some humor to me as well. So... so I, I'm just I, I'm looking at at the basic algorithms for these things. It, it seems like the lower you go, the more in control the algorithms are. Yeah. So now we have a you know million year old armor plated immortal spore forming little shithead bacteria that yep. might be controlling everything we do. Yeah. Does that scare you? You know, no, because so far mm -hmm. they're doing all the right things, right? Okay. So they're they're helping. But they don't want to die, all right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we we are the hosts. Um, what's interesting about them is they do something called quorum sensing these yes. microbes, right? Yes. Um, and and the way they were used in the prescription world for the last sixty years is, uh, and this is these drugs are still on the market today. They were used to treat dysentery. Interesting story of how that was discovered. So when when the German army in, in uh, World War II were in North Africa. 
most of the German soldiers were dying from dysentery rather than the war. Yeah. They realized that the locals there, when they would get upset stomach, the, what the first thing they would do is they would eat dry camel dung. Well, I thought it was fresh camel dung. Right. Um, so what they would do is they would take fresh camel dung and they would dry they it. They would dry it. Okay. They would dry it, yeah. I think that made it more palatable. Uh, you know, and then I just they, thought it was a smoothie. <laughs> and then and then they would keep um, stores of dried camel dung. So it's they better than a kale smoothie. By it the way. Is, so that, yeah. I'm in total agreement with that. Um, and certainly no brine shrimp or anything. Right, there you, you know, those damn brine shrimp. But then they would eat that. So then Germans took back uh, the the dung, and then there was German pharmaceutical company actually isolated Bacillus subtilis, oh, one wow. of the main uh, probiotic strains in this product as being the antimicrobial bacteria. So the bacteria has the capability of going in, reading the microbial environment. Every bacteria in your gut and everywhere in the world puts out a chemical signature, and they can read the chemical signature of the bacteria. They can find the pathogenic bacteria, go sit next to them, and produce up to 20 different antibiotics in that little area, killing off that bad bacteria. So that's how they were first discovered and used in the pharmaceutical space. I also missed that point. I I, I know about the camel dung story because yeah. it's, it's sort of like the the birth of probiotics, yeah. right? Um, and it was it was clearly some British officer going, "How dare the primitives eat poop?" Right. And he's like, <laughs> "Everyone else who didn't eat poop died. Okay, yeah. I'll eat poop, and, but I'll have my little finger up like, when right. I do it, like Look I drink at those my tea." Savages. Yeah. yeah, and then that was like like just noticing what what works. Um, but I did not realize that that was where uh, Bacillus subtilis came from because I, I read about that in Superhuman yeah. too. Yeah. Although you have a specific strain called HU58 yeah. in the Just Thrive formula. What uh, There's hundreds and hundreds of different strains. Yep. How did you arrive at the HU58? Yeah, so the one of the most important qualities when you're looking for a strain is its ability to colonize in the gut. And you can find many different Bacillus subtilis. It's all over you know? the place, yeah. Yeah, they're all over the place. But what we did is looking at screening many of these strains, many of them don't express the protein to actually bind in the gut lining and, and exist there. And so that is the first fundamental check you have to do. Um, and a lot of that work was actually done by Royal Holloway London University. We worked with Dr. Simon Cutting there, who's like the preeminent spore researcher in the world. And and the the reason why um, the strain call is called HU is that that stands for Holloway University, strain number 58. So he had isolated hundreds and hundreds of subtilis strains, screened them all for which one had the best function in the gut. And this one has amazing robust function in the gut. Okay, so you basically went deep with the scientists who are looking at these and said, "All right, that's cool." Yeah, so this is a, it's a a pretty good, a pretty good mix of of things there, uh, and I've definitely started taking it. Yeah, um, I have not quantified any changes in my gut bacteria since I started taking it, just because I haven't like done a poop test recently. Um, I have four Viome test kits at home. <laughs> I just have to decide to send them in. Yeah. Um, okay, that's that's fascinating. You talked about something called quorum sensing, and and you're saying that the bacteria strains you have here are helping with quorum sensing somehow. They do. So they um, so not only can they read other bacteria signals uh, and figure out what other bacteria are doing, what other bacteria are there, they also facilitate um, language within the bacteria, communication within the microbes, part, partly to kind of coordinate efforts within the microbiome. So for example, one of the things we tested, which is really important not only to our health, mitochondrial health, and so on, are, is the production of short-chain fatty acids, right? Butyrate, big, big protein. Names. Acetate, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, pause for one second there. Um, the reason that you care about butyrate specifically, uh, if you're listening to this, is butyrate is highly ketogenic. Yeah. So the two fatty acids that are going to raise your ketones the most are the stuff in brain octane, which is caprylic acid that's processed a specific way, and butyric acid or butyrate. And if you yeah. read the Bulletproof Diet, you know how important butyrate is. If you didn't read it, listen to what Karen's going to say. Yeah, and it and it. Butyrate controls everything, our, our localized and systemic metabolism. So for yeah. example, butyrate turns on the genes that tells your, your body to improve insulin uh, sensitivity. It turns on something called AMP kinase, which turns on fat burning in all of the cells across your body. And it all starts in the gut, right? So it's it's so important. Butyrate also is a strong anti-inflammatory. Uh, anti um, it's also the main fuel source for all of the cells that line your intestinal lining. Yeah. You know, it's uh, the the uh, the enteric cells that line your, your lining. But 
one of the things that we were wanted to see is that you know a big source of butyrate is through your microbiome, yeah. and so we want to see can these strains actually increase the coordination of butyrate production by all of the butyrate producers within the microbiome. So, so you're not saying do our probiotics raise butyrate, but when you take them, do they cause the system to create butyrate? Exactly, because cool. you know, and here's what's important about that is. You know, there's a hundred trillion bacteria in the gut, right? Any one species going into that amazing pool, if whatever function they do cannot really have a massive effect because they're in a they're a tiny species in the pool of a hundred trillion cells of bacteria. Their real profound effect comes from orchestrating the rest of the microbiome to also follow suit. Right. So we've tested the butyrate production capability of the strange and just thrive probiotic, and we've seen that they do produce butyrate. But when you put them into the microbiome, what you see is about a 150% increase in butyrate production in two or three weeks by all the butyrate producers in the gut. Wow. By fecalum bacteria, by acromantia, by ruminococcus, all of these other microbes that are the predominant butyrate producers, all in coordination start increasing butyrate production in a massive way. I tried to convince uh, people at uh, Bulletproof to name our conference rooms after species of gut bacteria. <laughs> the ones you just Love mentioned. It. But no one could spell them, so <laughs> it, it failed entirely. Right. But you did mention acromancia in there. Yes. That is something that is in uh, the new Superhuman book. Awesome. Talk about acromancia. Yeah. I probably know what you're going to say because I wrote a chapter that yeah. included a bunch, but talk about that one and then talk about what the just... Thrive probiotic does to acromantia if you have data on it. And we do. So that's oh, a that's a study we published a month ago. Oh my just god! Came out, okay. Right? <laughs> um, this hot off the press. So acromantia is one of those keystone strains within the microbiome. There are these players that we call keystone strains or keystone species because their job is so important, not only for the human host, but also for the maintenance of the rest of the microbiome. One of the things that acromantia has been studied extensively for is it's inversely correlated to everything under the metabolic syndrome category. You know, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, um, all different forms of aging, inflama aging, which is, a you know, the yeah. whole driving of aging through chronic inflammation. Acromantia is inversely correlated, meaning high acromantia, you have protection against all of those things. Um, acromantia is an obligate anaerobe, meaning it cannot ex uh, breathe in oxygen, so you can't grow it in a factory and take it in as a uh, as a uh, you know uh, probiotic and so we wanted to see can we actually increase the growth of these keystone strains by adding in these spores because they seem to be orchestrators of the rest of the microbiome so in our study we actually looked at acromantia growth in human subjects and we found that we saw a thousand fold increase in acromantia in a four week period in in humans in uh, healthy human subjects. Is that because those healthy humans only had one and it went from one to a thousand? Because <laughs> a thousand fold is kind of a big deal. It's huge. It's a it's a three log increase, right? People should actually live longer with yes. that big of a change. That That's absolutely true. So most of these people were considered to be healthy humans because we didn't pick anyone with any particular disease state, but we know what healthy human actually means. Wow. Um, now they came in with pretty low levels of acromantia. One of the subjects actually had undetectable levels of acromantia. Four weeks later now has really high levels of acromantia. Without fasting. Without fasting. Because fasting or intermittent fasting is the other it way to it. raise yep. it. And that's a big part of what I read about absolutely. in Superhuman. Which is so important, you know, because not only does intermittent fasting increase acromantia, uh, and it does that because it allows acromantia to eat the top layer of your mucus, right? Right. Uh, but that eating of the top layer of the mucus stimulates a gene called the MUC-T gene, which causes your goblet cells, some of the cells that produce mucus, to produce new mucus. So actually recycling your mucus layer, which is super important to clearing all kinds of toxins and infections and all that from your body, that's the job of acromancia. I, I just registered upgradedmucus.com. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Uh, so that that is a, a actually a very eloquent explanation of what acromancia does. You okay. Know. We've got to go a little deeper on LPS. This is another chapter in Superhuman. Oh, awesome. Uh, <laughs> and it's something in, in the Bulletproof Diet. I write about that extensively. That was like 2014, the first big keto book. Yeah. And the the idea there is that lipopolysaccharides are made by the bad bacteria in your gut, yeah. right? And then they cross the gut barrier. And what do they do when these endotoxins float around the body? Yeah, and to the system. So they are incredibly pervasive. So here are some of the things, just the highlights of what right. they can do. 
number one, they can enter the brain. So they cross the blood brain barrier. They can get into places like the amygdala, the hippocampus. They can, they can severely uh, create adverse effects on memory, recall, um, you know, cognitive function, IQ reduction. They are the, um, the perpetuators of the inflammation associated with Alzheimer's. That was a study in September 2017. They showed that the inflammation that, that starts the process of Alzheimer's comes from LPS, from the gut. Uh, they can get into your joints and soft tissue and trigger autoimmune response. Um, they become the most chronic inflammatory source in your body. That's a low-grade chronic inflammation. So now do you see why I call bacteria and gut little bastards? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what they do. Right? Like they're they not your friends. They're not well, your... some of them might be your friends some of the time if it's in their best interest. Exactly. So, like, yes. They're, they're the most uh, psychopathic friends you've ever had. <laughs> they are, yeah. They're very selfish. You know? Yeah. Even the things that they do that are beneficial to us, they're really doing it for themselves. Right. You know? <laughs> and we just happen to reap some benefit. Yeah, we, we get the, the dregs. Exactly, <laughs> we do. You know, and then this LPS also gets into your uh, mitochondria. It shuts down yes. mitochondria. It can get into um, and interfere with dopamine receptors, serotonin receptors, make so you mood depressed. alteration, make you depressed, make you anxious. Exactly. Um, so it, it, oh, and then in your gums, it can cause gum disease disease and gingivitis. It gets everywhere. It's so pervasive and it's coming from your gut, leaking through. So our focus was, can we stop LPS from leaking yes. from the uh, lumen into the circulatory system? And we saw over a 60% reduction in LPS translocation, meaning leaking through in 30 days of just taking the probiotic, not doing anything else. So imagine if you do all the other stuff that you talk again? about. It was... 60%? 60% reduction in all kinds of LPS throughout the body? Absolutely, yeah. Jesus. And and all of the inflammatory markers that LPS upregulates. And all of these inflammatory markers are the ones associated with all the chronic illnesses, yeah. you know? Um, one really interesting facet that we saw, which we did not expect, but we saw, was the function of ghrelin, the hunger hormone. Yes. Right? So we took these subjects who had high LPS and um, and they would they would come in fasted, so we'd measure their hunger hormone levels, and they'd be high, as as expected. And then we'd give them a two thousand calorie meal, and the hunger hormone levels would barely drop, which means that the gut and the brain are not communicating um, and telling the brain stop producing hunger hormones. We got enough calories. Mm -hmm. Thirty days after taking the probiotic, when they would come in fasted, hunger hormones being high, they would get a meal. Hunger hormone levels would drop by fifty percent. So now we're seeing that Similar restoration. Similar to what ketones do. Right. Absolutely. We're seeing that restoration of the gut-brain communication where the gut can now tell the brain, hey, we've got enough stuff. Stop producing the hunger hormones. Stop overeating. Wow. You know? But you talked about uh, LPS as well. Um, there's this one kind of MCT oil with eight carbon chains. Again, this is unrelated to anything that Bulletproof may or may not do that may or may not be um, in any particular coffee blend that's famous. Um, is <laughs> is shown to uh, protect the liver, at least in one study, probably in animals from LPS induced toxicity. Yeah. Right. So what's going on here is how do we reduce the formation of of lipopolysaccharides in the gut, and how do we reduce the absorption of them if they are produced? Yeah. So the important thing about the fatty acid, so one of the ways that that fatty acid works to reduce LPS. We're talking about the C8 caprylic acid, that exactly, one? Exactly, yep, absolutely. <laughs> Which may or may not be in anything we're talking about, but... Um, By the way, this show, just so everyone's known, this is my show, not Bulletproof's show. Right. Just so we're clear. Um, and so it, it, it um, actually creates a surfactant like with bile, and then and that uh, fatty acid, because LPS is a fatty acid, it basically grabs LPS and takes it out of the system. Oh, can we rip on keto for a minute here? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Hey, guys, did you know that if you eat a high-fat diet, a high-fat diet without enough dietary fiber or other binders in the gut will escort LPS into your system and raise mm -hmm. levels dramatically in your brain? Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's actually how we induce LPS endotoxemia in this exactly. trial. <laughs> we we feed them a, a high fat meal, and you get a six fold increase in LPS in the serum um, after that meal. Within five hours after that meal, a six fold increase. In fact, the university that we did the study with did a previous study where they showed that it took the body almost two weeks to recover from a single meal uh, when when they have that kind of LPS translocating. So, you know. so one approach would be go on a low fat diet. And we know what happens when you do that. Yeah. Generally, metabolic mayhem. Yeah, because absolutely. Well, wait a minute. Aren't all the cells in the body made out of certain kinds of fat? Yeah. Right? So then you could say, all right, 
let's talk about what kind of fat because different fats, oh my God, could they do different things? Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and, and then like you said, the the so the really important thing is that combining it with the plant-based materials. Yeah. You know, because the microbes in your large intestine produce protective compounds against all of this dysfunction. You know, the the short chain fatty acids in particular, yeah. right? And the upregulation of the tight junction proteins, those junctions that maintain the barrier of the intestinal lining. And then the production of uh, you know butyrate stimulates um, uh, the formation of mucus. So that's the biggest source of mucus stimulation uh, with acromancia is the formation of butyrate. And so all of those barriers now function better when and you can your your body can handle some of that fat without increasing LPS translocation. So let's uh, let's pick on bulletproof coffee for a minute here. Yeah, uh, I, I have some theories here, but you know you you may have different theories, and I have no idea what you're going to say. Um, that is kind of got some saturated fat in there. Yeah. Um, it, it's called butter, right? And it's got some brain octane, which is technically a saturated fat. Uh, wouldn't that escort LPS into the blood? So it could if your microbiome is not healthy, you know, but people can have a protective microbiome if they have a full diverse diet like you recommend as well. So, so I, um, I think it's important. One of the things that, that just that I'm I'm actually way more in alignment with vegans than they think because yeah. I always like to tease them on the show. Even <laughs> right. though yes, I have vegan friends and I was a raw vegan for quite a while. Um, it, it's that I will not eat industrial animal meat. Period. Yeah. I I don't do it because it's bad for animals. It's bad for soil. It's bad for water. It's bad for the planet. And there's antibiotics in there, which is bad for me. It's yeah, bad for my absolutely. gut bacteria. So if you're going to say I'm going to go eat French fries, okay. There's a whole bunch of problems there. There's lectins from the potatoes going to poke holes in your gut, and the fats are super damaged, and they're going to escort LPS through. Yeah. And if you eat those with a nice burger that's made from industrial meat, now you've poisoned your gut bacteria with antibiotics that are present in the meat. And, well, who knows what's going to happen. My theory, and this is what I want you to either support or reject with, like, I'm totally fine with whatever you say here. Um, so I, I looked at LPS when I first had the first time I put butter in a blender. I'm like, like it was kind of a, am I going to die here? Everything I know <laughs> right. says this is good. Really, I just come back from Tibet. Yeah. Like I got to try this, uh, and I was aware of the LPS thing, but I was also aware of okay, um, what happens when you use the specific types of fats that protect the liver from LPS? Yeah. And also, coffee itself is a plant based compound. There's a little bit of fiber in there. And certain kinds of gut bacteria like to eat uh, polyphenols, yeah. right? This is the uh, bacteriodides. Mm -hmm. uh, and the firmicutes, they hate fat, right? So it turns out the theory, one of the six about why clearly Bulletproof Coffee, people have lost like a million pounds, according to, to estimates out there, on the Bulletproof diet using Bulletproof Coffee and things like that. Um, so clearly it's doing something that works. Yeah. But- you know, is it based on leptin and ghrelin and CCK, or is it based on modulating the levels by suppressing gut bacteria using fat and feeding bacteriodides with polyphenols at the same time? Yep. That's the theory I want to test with you. Is that a decent idea, or is it something else? You know, it's it's really interesting. So when I first learned about Bulletproof Coffee, it was, it was a fascinating combination to me, right? Because rarely do you get the combination of the of the caffeine and all the polyphenols that come within the caffeine uh, with that kind of fat. It's in not anything. a natural combination. <laughs> exactly, you don't get it. Um, and I've, I've done it myself. I, I used to be a very competitive cyclist, so I used to do it before going out yeah. on training rides and racing and all Did that. It, work? it it worked absolutely because yeah. I was I was very big on not using gel packs right. in it, during the rides and during races. So I wanted to fuel with something else, right? Um so so it was it the effect was really quite significant. I think a big part of it is the the caffeine portion of it and what all comes within coffee because um one of the big um, villains in all of this fat metabolism issue are microbes that produce secondary bile salts, right, from bile secretion. Mm -hmm. And when you have secondary bile salts, that actually dramatically increases inflammation in your gut lining and actually can make your gut more permeable and, and creates dysbiosis in your large intestine. You know, the assistance of the coffee, which is really interesting because the the polyphenols and the, and the components within that coffee mm -hmm. um, actually inhibit the production of secondary bile salts. 
And I didn't so, know that either. Wow. That's, that's I'm kind of well read on coffee. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Then that's one one of the really important facets of of good organic coffee is that it actually has that mechanism of action of preventing secondary bile salts, which can then reduce the inflammation in the gut and actually allow your body to utilize fat the way it's supposed to. Also, here's the thing. The secondary bile salt producing bacteria are the gram negative bacteria that contain all the LPS. So they're in so the, the coffee in itself can inhibit the LPS producing bacteria. So in inherently you are reducing the amount of LPS that's even there in the small intestine. So you're you're probably negating the absorption of it in a significant way just by that combo. That is a seventh theory about why coffee might work <laughs> that I missed. God damn it. Uh, wow. Okay, you just blew my mind on that one entirely. Uh, so, okay, so secondary bile salt inhibition. And the other thing, and this we didn't know this when I wrote uh, The Bulletproof Diet um, because the research hadn't come out of UC San Diego yet, but the amount of caffeine in two small cups of coffee doubles ketone production. Yeah. And if you do that, you're saying, oh, wait, I got butyric acid in the butter which also raises ketones, and you got brain octane that raises ketones, you're sort of thinking, okay, if ketones go up to anywhere between 0.38 and 0.5 millimoles in the blood, that lowers uh, ghrelin yeah. and raises CCK. And so yeah. that's another theory, and you got the bacteria theory, and like, I don't know which one it is, but I was yeah. hoping you could tell, maybe it's more than one, but well, something the, cool's the going on in there. Yeah, <laughs> the butyric acid is huge. You okay. know, the butyric acid is the thing that upregulates the AMPK, which makes every cell in your body burn fat more. It upregulates these peptides called GLP-1, mm -hmm. PYY, which increase uh, insulin sensitivity. Um, in fact, the the main drug used for insulin uh, for metformin. diabetes, metformin, a couple years ago, they figured out the way metformin works is by increasing butyrate production. Holy you know? crap. I, I, I was about to say, tell me about AMPK and metformin and your take on coffee, caffeine, butyric acid and all that. But you're saying that metformin increases butyrate production? That's, that's its main method of that action. That was via AMPK stimulation. No, so it's uh, the metformin actually changes the microbiome and increases butyrogenic bacteria. However, because it, of the nature of the synthetic drug, it actually, the, the effect wears off over time. It also you know? seems to permanently inhibit your vitamin B12 absorption exactly, even after you yeah. stop taking it, which is bad. Right. So it's, it's so you have temporary benefit from it, and that's okay. why doctors who manage diabetics know that when you start in metformin, typically they start around 400 milligrams, and then they have to keep going up and up and up and up, and then as they go up, it creates more dysfunction within the microbiome, but that initial help is from the increase in butyrate. So if you're getting <laughs> your butyrate from your butter or your probiotics like in Just Thrive, you're negating all of that. Well, well, newsflash, for cheaper than at least name brands metformin, you can buy butyric acid. It smells like nasty cheese and socks. <laughs> right. Um, and you can take it in capsules. And I used to do it quite a bit. Uh, and I still do it like when I fly and things like that because I know it raises ketones. But uh, it makes your hands smell like socks. Yeah. <laughs> so you can measure it. That's a I think a $200 test with Viome, or you can take a supplement and say, well, the supplement is shown to do this in studies. I'm going to assume it's doing it for me, yeah. but stop eating industrial animal meat yeah, because absolutely. it won't work. Yeah. I don't know. Actually, does it work? Your stuff might work with that stuff. I don't, I don't know. But. You know, we it, it conferred a protective effect. But even if you're still, eating garbage? Even if you're eating garbage. So okay. the way we stimulate LPS is we give a high fat, high caloric meal, but it's a fast food meal. Yeah. And we see this huge increase in LPS in the serum. And then 30 days later we did the same meal challenge and then the lps is gone so even eating that cleaned crappy out the bad meal, stuff okay. exactly um it, it can be protective but we wouldn't encourage you to eat shitty meals all the time um well, but I, i'm gonna be kind of straightforward look if i can take some sort of genetically engineered crazy human produced uh, probiotic that yeah. doesn't exist today that would allow me to eat crap yeah like one of those fake meat burgers that's entirely processed <laughs> right. food. It's like oh a Snickers God. bar, but not yeah. as good. Um, I, I would love to be able to, in fact, I, that would liberate a lot of humans who just yeah. can't afford, you know, grass fed, whatever stuff. It would. Um, so let, yes, let's create that. But at the same time, 
you simply must not eat industrial animal food because even if your body can handle it because you've hacked your gut bacteria, mm -hmm. trust me, the soil and the water and the animals can handle it. So don't do that because it's unethical and it's bad for you. Absolutely. Uh, bad for the world. Yeah. Literally, like like yeah. We, we must stop that behavior. Distributed agriculture to build soil, which sucks carbon out of the air. Yes. That's what animal poop does. And you cannot have your vegan kale salad, whatever, without crap from mm -hmm. animals in it. And someone has to eat the animal. I'm raising my hand to do that. <laughs> Sorry. I'm with you. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. Let's talk a little bit about what happens when you eat too much protein. Yeah, I love it. I actually just did a webinar on this too much protein thing. Um, you know, number one is protein can be problematic in a few different ways. Protein stimulates a type of fermentation called proteolytic fermentation. Mm -hmm. And these microbes that break down protein will create ammonia. They'll create P-cresol. They'll create aldehydes and things that are just very toxigenic. Uh, in fact, a great example of this type of putrefication fermentation that goes on is in people with a condition called hepatic encephalopathy. You mean bodybuilders? Uh, <laughs> just go to a gym. <laughs> That's a clinical term for bodybuilders. <laughs> just, yes. just kidding. Yeah, liver uh, failure patients. <laughs> actually, which is if you're on, it, on the road there. I, I was just joking about the high protein diet, well-known effects on farting. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, um, so we, we did a study actually with which just submitted for publication on liver failure patients. Okay. Uh, what's really interesting about them is if they get two or three grams too much protein in a, any given day, they can die within hours. And the reason wow. for that is their liver is obviously not functioning because they're end stage liver failure. So they get too much protein, which can be just a few grams. Uh, ammonia is created in that protein digestion. P. cresols created. All this inflammation happens. And then it's the job of the liver to clear that ammonia yes. from your body, right? But if your liver is not working and it can't clear the ammonia, it's going to get into your blood. And then it seeps into the brain and creates swelling in the brain, and they can die very quickly. And so we wanted to see, can we use a probiotic to actually bring down that kind of putrefied fermentation from protein? And we saw over a 40% reduction in blood ammonia levels in end-stage liver failure patients when you take the spores that are in just, just Thrive Probiotic. Um, wow. And that's so important because what people do is they— hammer their body with protein. Oh yeah. You know, with with the idea that it's just and globally casein, good for you. Milk protein isolate and you know, exactly brand stuff that chains this yeah. and that. And you it, know? it actually sucks the the uh the polyphenols that are in coffee yep. and spices and, and all the good stuff. When you take milk protein isolate in coffee, it binds to the coffee polyphenols so you cannot absorb them. Yeah. And people are doing that. It's like you should read the manual before you try to, you know, make stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and and then and then of course you're facilitating this putrefication type of fermentation that occurs not only in the small bowel, but in the large bowel. And then eventually what it does is it creates lower diversity within the microbiome because there's only certain types of bacteria that can metabolize protein that well. And so over time with this, you know crazy amounts of protein that people are taking, they end up reducing the diversity within the microbiome, hurting the liver, because the liver is to clear all this stuff that's being made, increasing leaky gut, and, and creating this toxigenic thing. Oh, and a 400% increase in all-cause mortality Absolutely. when you go over 20% protein. Mm -hmm. Um, talk to me about vitamin K2 and how that's formed in the guts and the different flavors of K2. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a huge fan of supplementing K2 and making it on board. Yeah. So how does that work? Yeah, well, K2 is is such an important uh, vitamin. I, I, I actually call it the quintessential vitamin to yeah. supplement, right? Um, because we don't get enough of it in our diet, certainly, anymore. And, and supplementing it, getting endogenous production is so important. We started studying, so these bacillus endospores make very high amounts of K2, in fact. Okay, these are the ones that are in Just Thrive. In the Just Thrive okay. probiotic. And in fact, um, the commercially available uh, natural forms of K2-7 come from bacillus fermentation. So we actually do a fermentation process, extract the K2 out of the fermentation media, and sell that as a commercial uh, source of vitamin K2, and in particular K2-7. So what they make is a seven uh, version. Uh, what you find in animal tissue and all is a four version, you know, and so you, I know you work with both. Um, you can, I mean, you can get K1 from kale, which doesn't mm -hmm. do squat, Yeah. Um, other than give you kidney stones. Oh no, that's the kale, not the K1, sorry. Right. Sorry. Just <laughs> right. Like, I, I'm like, I'm just done with kale. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so there's K1, which doesn't count. Yeah. And then if you want to get K2, yeah. there's there's K2-4 yeah. and K2-7. Yeah. And uh, apparently they're both clinically active. 
but the only real nutritional sources that are concentrated are like natto yep. and some really aged cheeses. Natto, if you've never had the joy of uh, throwing up in your mouth, <laughs> yes. um, it is a traditional Japanese food, which some yeah. people, including my wife, really like. And it's basically like snot mixed with ground nuts. It is. Yeah. It's horrifying. It's <laughs> yeah. horrifying tasting. In to, old to the West, yeah. yeah, to the Western palate anyway. Yeah. I, I, I respect you if you can eat it. I, I do eat fish eggs and, and all sorts of unusual foods, but I that is one I'm just you know, not going to, not going to no. do. <laughs> yeah. Um, even though it has health benefits. Other than that, aged cheese, natto, yep. where else can you find K2 in food? So um, the K2-4 form you can find in organ meat. So you can, if you eat right. brain, if you eat liver, all of those things, you can get that in there. Um, animal fat has some amount of K2-4. Yeah. In it Grass fed well. especially, yep. okay. Grass fed, yeah. And, and then you have the seven, which is bacterial fermentation based, exactly. which is made in the gut. In the gut, yeah. Okay. And, and when we started studying, why is it that bacteria make K2, right? Because we know in humans, K2 builds bones, it removes calcium from the arteries, it increases neurological logical uh, function and so on, what are bacteria using K2 for? And we, we actually started studying this about a decade ago. We realized that bacteria use vitamin K2 as an electron transporter in in um, their their version of mitochondria. Wow. Um, you know, and okay. so our question was, does K2 function as an electron transporter in our mitochondria? Because our mitochondria are ancient bacteria. We, we normally use you know? NAD for that. Right? Absolutely. And so okay. what we found is we did a, a study with Texas Tech. Um, there's a machine called a seahorse machine, a very uh, expensive half a million dollar machine where you can study individual mitochondria and put mm -hmm. all kinds of substrates in and see how it impacts the bioenergetics of the uh, mitochondria. When we put K2 into the mitochondria, we saw a 40% increase in ATP production. Holy crap. 40%. In our mitochondria. In our mitochondria. We use uh, neuromoblast neuroblastoma cells. Um, and so we're blown away by that. And then we dug into the research. And as it turns out, in the 1950s, a researcher wrote a paper that vitamin K2 facilitates redox reactions in the cell and probably will increase ATP production. And then a decade later, another scientist came out and said, oh, that's probably nonsense. So nobody looked at it after that. <sighs> You know, and so, um, and nobody had the technology to test it then, right? Do you know of a safe upper limit for K2 or should I eat like a half a kilo a day? <laughs> so um, we have not found an LD50. So that's a okay. lethal dose 50 for vitamin K2. We've in fact published two um, toxicity studies on K2 where we've gone as high as 2,000 times a recommended human dose and there's no mortality or adverse ev events with K2. Um, that's of course an animal study, you know. So so basically what's happening is the K2 gets stored in the fat in the body and it, either it's used used or it's not used. And if it's not used, it's just sitting there. It doesn't confer any toxicity in the body. There's something else that we haven't talked about that I thought was particularly cool. Um, and that is, uh, it says in big letters, no refrigeration needed. And a lot of probiotics <laughs> right. die. I'm, I've always wondered if they die, if they're not in the fridge, as soon as I put them in my, in my gut, they're going to be 98.6. Totally, yes. But let's not think about that. It. Yeah. That's, that's, that's not to say they can't work. Some of them clearly do work. I've seen, yeah. I've known people have been cured from all sorts of bad things with this. But it says here that they're stable up to 455. Yeah. So will they withstand steam? Oh, good question. Um, uh, steam, yes, because of the calcified armor coating. Okay. So steam is pervasive to many bacteria because it can make its way right through the phospholipid layer. Wow. Um, these guys can withstand steam as well. So I, I don't know if I've ever you know, come clean about this, but uh, I think I was a samurai in a past life. Because <laughs> if I'm going to drink alcohol, which isn't very often, uh, I like sake. Yeah. <laughs> but I also really like uh, sushi. Everyone knows that. Yes. But there's something called mochi. Yes. Uh, which is, uh, if you're listening to this, like, oh, mochi ice cream, I know that. Mochi is actually the layer of rice around the ice cream. And in order to make that, you take a special kind of rice and you steam it. You can't boil it. You have to steam it a certain way. And then you pound the crap out of it. And so that's what they would make kids do in ancient Japan. So you'd steam it and then you have to like hit it for hours with these big like wooden uh, pole things. Right. And you get this gooey, sticky stuff. Now, we all know that cooked and cooled rice makes resistant starch, which feeds gut bacteria. So uh, what I do is I do that, and then I throw in some brain octane, because, hey, that's good stuff. And I throw in some extra resistant starch and prebiotic stuff. Uh, and 
what I have not been able to do up till now, though, is because it comes out of this. I have a machine that does it because I'm too lazy to make my kids pound it. <laughs> um, but I'm really interested in being able to, after I've uh, pounded the rice, to actually add the uh, the Just Thrive probiotic to it. So yeah. Even though I bake the mochi later or do whatever with it, it would still be there and still be active. So I would actually have a source of resistant starch from cooked and cooled rice. Oh, and we know if you cook and cool rice with either coconut oil or brain octane, it makes extra resistant starch. But would would that actually work? I could bake this stuff as yeah, long as absolutely. it's under 455? Yeah, absolutely. It, does it taste like crap? I've never actually opened a capsule. No, it has It has actually no taste to it at all. All right. Yeah. So, so guys, listen up. What if, <laughs> what if you were to just open a probiotic capsule and pour it in whatever you were going to bake yeah. or cook it seems like that might be kind of a cool way to just get it in there and get it to your kids yeah your kids would know anyway, okay mm -hmm. the 455 number really caught my attention because i'm thinking what could i do that's weird with that and that was the weirdest <laughs> thing i could think of that's pretty weird but also very awesome all right wow. anyways now um can i do lines of it uh, yeah well <laughs> You know, we can't say this as a supplement, but there is a Facebook group dedicated to that, which right. we did not start, but okay. people are doing it. It, it sounds in incredible, like, oh my God, Dave, how could you say that? Now I have to explain to my kids what doing lines is. <laughs> so, children, here's what doing lines is. Sometimes adults do stupid stuff and they snort things they shouldn't snort through their nose right? because there's something called transmucosal delivery. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, are familiar with nasal spray, uh, that's how it works because your mucus absorbs things. Now, you can ask your mommy and daddy about what it is they're snorting. <laughs> but the reason I'm asking is that I grew up with chronic sinus infections. Yes. But if these were in your sinuses, because we do breathe probiotics all the time, we're doing yes. it right now, do they break up biofilms or are, are they otherwise part of the bacterial biome found in the sinuses? Yeah. So um, I, I actually did a little bit of research on this because I wanted to understand where all we naturally expose ourselves to these spores. Um, desert dust that's lifted up from, from Africa, blows through Europe, most of Central Asia, um, contains very high levels of these spores. And Doesn't so it kills coral too? Um, <laughs> you know, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Sad ass. Definitely brine shrimp. Yeah. Um, <laughs> They deserved it. <laughs> exactly, those damn brine shrimp. Um, but but so we are breathing these in all the time. And these spores do make an enzyme called alpha amylase. And that alpha amylase is a biofilm disruptor. It breaks it up. So that's one of the ways that they go after pathogenic bacteria is they're able to break down the pathogenic biofilms and get at those bacteria themselves. Um, so, so I would say if they are found in your sinus cavities, um, as some people have reported to us that they've somehow found them in their sinus cavities, um, that it seems to confer some significant benefit in there. I'm out of questions, but uh, you've blown my mind in like six different ways on this. Yeah. Um, in fact, this is, I think, a, a more complete and awesome episode than I'd even hoped. Uh, is there anything that I didn't ask you about these cool species you're working with that you think is is worthy of people's attention? Yeah, absolutely. And one, one other thing, we just submitted a study uh, to the British Journal of Dermatology. We did an acne study with these spores, and we found- Topically or internally? Uh, internally. Okay. And that it goes back to the gut-skin axis. And a lot of that is dependent on the butyrate acetate production in the gut. So we saw a 45% reduction in acne lesions in 30 days of taking the probiotic. Holy crap. Does that work in teenagers Insane. too? Absolutely. These were the, the average oh age was 18. Yeah, and, and yeah. Tina has personal- um, um, you know, proof yep. that with, with her kids. And so that is a very exciting area for us right now so, because we're, we're, we can impact the skin from the gut. From so, the so you're telling me I could hide this stuff in a teenager's junk food? And their acting would get better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dang. Really sick. And, <laughs> and 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 their and their mood will probably get yeah. better as yeah. well. That's the important. And they'll thing. grow faster. And they'll <laughs> exactly. grow a third eye and superpowers. I totally heard you. You said all that, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, that that gut skin access component is really important. You know, um, that that's a very exciting study that we just finished. So uh, one thing that I I noticed uh, as a just a, even as an adult, not to mention as a teenager. Um, I would get these uh, subterranean uh, pimples, uh, just like really yeah, deep ones, almost like a boil yeah. on my face. And huge, right? They're yeah. big. Yeah. 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 And uh, they were always correlated with gut inflammation. Yeah. And so uh, later when I figured out what was going on, you put me in a in a, in a place that has really nasty, like sacubotrys, the black yeah. mold, stuff like that. That stuff causes a shedding of the lining of the gut and gut inflammation. It yeah. causes a change in the bacterial biome in the nose, right? And then- 
Three days later, massive pimples. Yeah. And if you talk to the acupuncturist, there's actually meridians on the face where you get pimples in a line that go down like the side of your jaw. That's where the intestinal meridian is on the face. And like, wow, maybe this is all just you know a bunch of made up stuff, and you know there's no science behind it. Yeah, whatever. Um, it was repeatable, which is let's see, scientific method. Um, yeah. Observation. <laughs> that's the first. Part. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. uh, well, definitely not science. Anyway, right. I noticed that, and and it's very clear that when there's gut inflammation, the skin will follow. And I believe it's a three day window most of the time. You might like see dryness or something earlier than that, but the pimples are a three day later effect. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is my number right? Is it two or is it four? Um, no, three actually. Three? Okay. Yeah, makes sense because and for the for the translation of the inflammation from the gut all the way to the skin will take that that amount okay. of time because of, and part of it is the changing of the skin microbiome and then the infection that occurs in the sebaceous gland you know and like any other infection it takes 2 3 days for it to come to fruition very cool you know uh, one last thing i do want to mention is i always explain to people that we as a human species we are a microbial construct right we are made up of microbes predominantly and because we are a microbial construct we have basically shot ourselves in the foot by putting ourselves in an antimicrobial world yeah. right everything around us kills bacteria especially the stuff like roundup and glyphosate and you know all the pesticides and herbicides and all that and so our microbiome and our microbial ecology is constantly under attack by just living in the Western world. And we did a study where we showed that, um, uh, and this is in a gastrointestinal system, where you add in you know, what is acceptable levels of uh, Roundup and glyphosate into a mi human microbiome, and it causes all of these measurable disruptions with all of the things we talked about, lower diversity, low short-chain fatty acids, all of that in just weeks, higher ammonia and so on. We put the spores into the system while the Roundup is still in there, and we started to see reversal of all of that. So I like to think of these spores as kind of our daily protection against this toxigenic world that destroys our microbial ecology. And that's uh, that's just a you know a, a little takeaway for people. All right, I I love that perspective, and when you say safe limits. We, earlier we talked about sort of the, the you know, it's all or nothing. Yeah. With Roundup, sorry guys, that actually is a nothing. Yeah, like, exactly. like there is no safe limit. <laughs> nope. Stop putting billions of pounds of that in here. Like that mm -hmm. is, a, a, it's not just a crime against humanity, it's a crime against nature. Absolutely. It, it's really yeah. bad. Way worse than people suppose via a lot of pathways and yeah. we've had other shows based on that, but I, I love it that you have an impact on that. Yeah. Um, I've got another final question for you guys that's tied in with Superhuman. Uh, Longtime listeners know for the first 500 or so episodes, I asked about human performance, and then I wrote a book summarizing all that knowledge. I focused on anti-aging. I'm going to live to at least 180. There's a big men's health article about that recently. Uh, and I want to know for you guys, and Steve, I'm going to start with you. Okay? You have access to not just the magic powers of a trial attorney, which means you can argue anyone into submission, <laughs> uh, but you now have probiotic superpowers. How long are you going to live? I'm going to live till 122. 122. That's a cool number. Why? Uh, 22 is an important number for us. And uh, I don't know, I want to live long. I love life. I love love everything about life. And um, and now that I live so healthy, um, I'm just excited to continue to live that way. So if it's longer, but 22 is an important number in our family. So. Got it. So you, just, you pick that one because you like the number. Yeah. All right. Works okay. for me. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I haven't picked a number, but my goal has always been to live long enough to leave a really strong, lasting impact on this world, right? And I'm thinking that's going to take at least till 90. So I'm, and then I want to enjoy the next 20 years after that, <laughs> just retiring. So about 110. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, right. so, but but the goal is, you know, how can I make a huge impact on this world? Um, and, and that takes time, so. You, you've got to be, what, mid-40s? Yeah, 43 just turned, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good deal. I don't know. It, it's, oh. you're, you're not supposed to ask me about there. <laughs> That's okay. Right. 50. Okay. So we're all about in the same age range. I'm mid 40s as well. Uh, actually, I'm 29. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I actually just had my 25th percent birthday. Nice. Wow. I'm, wow. I'm, I'm 46. Right? I love but, that. I mean, if, if you yeah. think about it, like I'm just barely in my, you know, my mid 20s. You're an adolescent. Uh, so. <laughs> um, but you think about that. Don't you guys think that all the doctors, all the, all the stuff going out there, don't you think we're going to maybe have some improvements over the next 50 years of your lives? Don't you think we can do a little bit better? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. why we're doing what we're doing. But, that's but exactly it. You yeah. haven't changed your number. Like, are you not factoring in the the hundreds of thousands of scientists working on the aging problem? All the studies you've just done, a yeah. thousand fold increase in acromancia, all that kind of stuff? Like. Yeah. 
Are, aren't you just... I haven't read your book yet. I need yeah, to read your exactly. book. Exactly. That's the okay. key. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I think you guys think it's small. I was hoping you say, oh, I'm going to have probiotics that you know regenerate my SCOBY in my brain or something right. crazy. <laughs> Yep. But all right, so I'll interview you again in two years, and you'll we'll, like we'll double probably, your we'll after after double your number. Yeah, yeah, after we read right. the book, yes, okay. it's a good deal. <laughs> okay, uh, it's been fascinating interviewing you. I learned some stuff I didn't think I was going to learn. Uh, thank you for being on the show. Your website, justthrivehealth.com, where you've got all the research and you've got the Just Thrive probiotics and stuff yep. like that. Um, and just one once more, wow, kind of mind blown. Thanks, yeah. thank you, Dave. Thank Thanks you, for Dave. Me. Really appreciate it. 